uh, will tell, hey, you have to do up to six vert vertical jump and have your partner see if he sees that your speed is diminishing or your height is not as high, then you're done. That's how you know so you, if you're below the threshold. Okay. So if you, you can't can complete yourself. six reps at the you don't have to. Yeah, performance it's level. That also like one to six. And as soon as your velocity decreases, whether it's your power output or just your speed or your height of your jump, then you're done. Learn to perform practical lessons so that you can immediately learn to optimize your health, happiness, and performance. Welcome to another episode of Learn to Perform. I'm your host, Braden Ostepchuk, and I have a great guest today who I'm really excited to talk to, Alex Serrard. Alex is a person. I'm going to edit this out. Alex is a sport performance coach with a specialization in sport movements and injury prevention. He brings a wealth of knowledge from personal experiences and science-based applications. Alex has a very extensive junior hockey playing career in the WHL, AJHL, and SJHL. Most recently, Alex played at the CIS level for the Pronghorns at the University of Lethbridge, where he graduated with a degree in kinesiology. Alex has great knowledge in movement patterns and has a very good rapport with his athletes. I have had the pleasure of knowing Alex for a number of years, and I know that he is full of passion and expertise, which we are going to be able to explore in detail today. So Alex, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be on this podcast. I've been listening to it quite some times now, and I absolutely love what you do. So I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, well, I owe a lot of that to you because you've inspired me to talk about a lot of different topics and bring us the different ideas and research and learn more and just continue the pursuit of optimization, which is something that you have really narrowed in, which is something that we're going to talk about. But before we get into that, I did a quick little intro on you, but I would love if you could just give everyone a quick background on who you are, what your story is, and also more specifically on what you are doing right now. For sure. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a chef Frenchie. Um, <laughs> grew up out east. Uh, to the surprise of a lot of people, I didn't learn to speak English. I was in grade 12. So I was like 17, 18. Um, I didn't speak a lick of English at all. Uh, I had to learn because I was thrown in with my hockey uh, teammates and uh, my team. I'll see on the, when you're traveling the team, you have nobody else around you that speaks French. So I had to just learn. Um, so I moved to Calgary when I was uh, in grade 12 played for UFA Bisons, played AAA, and then went on to, to have a bit of a, a roller coaster of a career in junior and then committed to University of uh, Regina first before going to Selkirk College and then eventually making my way to U L, where it's always what I wanted to play. And every time people ask me the question, why U L above everything else, it's easy. And you'll love this one because you know Steve really well. Uh, but for me, it's because of Doug Crashley. Um, ah, okay. I've been being in Calgary, I knew how big Doug was and how crash finishing was. And I just love as like, Hey, if that guy is that good and he went to U of L, U of L must be that good of a school. So I got to go to U of L. That's how right. I actually came to be U of L of any places is because I wanted to be like Doug Crashley. And then I, fortunately, when I moved here, I got to meet Steve, which you had early on in their podcast. And Steve to me was a mentor as well. Probably not to the extent of he's been to you just because you no, know, you've had him for so many years as your strength coach, right. but he taught me so much and still to this day, I'll give him a call or call. I'll give him a shout and say, Hey, I need your help with this. I need your help. And uh, yeah, he's been super supportive of my journey so far. So um, it's kind of how it came to be in that sense. And, but why U of L, uh, Doug Rush, why strength conditioning coach is, uh, and you and I, I think would talk about more. You were fortunate. You had a really good strength coach and Steve to help you through your process of billing yourself up to the college and then the pro ranks. Right. Um, I, I didn't have necessarily that chance. I had some good mentors, some good coaches, but they were more so on the training side, like trainers, not strength coaches per se. So throughout my career, I had a lot of injuries and I dealt with that uh, in a poor way because we never really looked at it in a sense, hey, um, how can we fix it and get you back 100%, get you back to where you need to be? Rather, we always looked at it, hey, how can we manage the pain and then get you back playing? There's never mm -hmm. a way to address the injuries. It's always really, hey, let's manage the pain and get you back out there. And then, and obviously, I was a bit of an ego driven too. I always wanted to, to push more and keep on going. So I always had, I feel like I was at a chip on my shoulder. I had to prove to a lot of people that I could make it. Uh, so that didn't really help. But still, there's no proper guiding. Uh, there's no, a lot of things that were missing. Fortunately, I read a lot prior to. So like I was kind of into this. I loved it. And <clears throat> while doing my undergrad, I read this one quote that said, strength coaches should learn like physiotherapists to get a better understanding of biomechanics, but mostly injury mechanics. 
um, which I think that in down the long run has helped me a lot because now I don't just look at strength training in the physiology terms and how to get athletes at their best, but I was like, hey, how can I get them also good movers so they don't have to go sit physiotherapist? If they do, it's because, okay, was it a uh, acute injury that happened during the game playing? That's nothing I can control. But if there's something I can control, how can we minimize those risks? And that's how my love fell, uh, or I fell in love with all that idea of training and helping younger athletes um, unleash your potential and really get to that point where they don't have to worry about injuries. And Stepper, you know this um, as much as almost anybody else, like at the pro rank, you don't make a lot of money. So if you want to make a career out of it, you do need to spend a long period of time training and then try to make your way up. Or you simply have to have a long career because if you don't make as much money, you need to have a longer career to be able to retire at some point if you hope to retire. Um, so for that reason, like longevity is crucial in athletes and that goes with health and without your health, without the ability to move well, you're not going to be at hundred percent. And that's where I, I struggle to see a lot of athletes going through that. The um, era has changed. Now you see a lot more younger strength coaches like myself coming in and are more, they're applying a lot more of that physiology and ideology behind their training. So uh, they understand, um, you know, the sports needs, they understand the biomechanics of the sports and the needs of the athletes. So don't just look at, what the textbooks has to say, uh, which is what maybe some issues with older strength coaches. And you see in the, in, in the NCAA, um, the NCAA, you'll have guys, uh, I think that was done on basketball players, if I'm not mistaken. They're looking at uh, vertical jump testing and uh, near 92% of athletes in their freshman year decrease their vert mm. because of the proper training or lack of training or never been trained. So basically they lose their natural abilities to jump because they go through a old mentality of training that doesn't apply to their sports, their needs. So those are the things that, no, I want to change. I want to bring new eras, especially in the town or a smaller city like Flatbridge where, um, no, it's always been done a certain way and things that never really change. I'm trying to change that and it's hard. No, people are set in their own ways and I get that. Uh, it's always comfortable, but I want to bring in a new outlook to training and how things should be done and how can they improve on the health of the athletes and their development. And that's why I created uh, Evo Athletics. Uh, about just shy of two years now, I've created Evo, um, left the University of Leverage. I worked there for five years as a strength coach and just I created a brand where uh, one, it could bring the athletes in, give the athletes some identity because you and I both know when you're in the off season, you don't have much of an identity besides your sport. You don't have a team to rely on. You don't have a group. You might have your friends at the ring, but it's always nice to come in and have like the same boys, the same group of guys all the time. You just say, like, hey, this is our group. This is my summer team. And I'm proud of being part of this, of this, this group. And I think we've kind of achieved that evil, um, especially on the hockey side. Definitely like, uh, the hockey group is really close. Uh, um, it's fun to see whether it's a college athletes or midget athletes, guys come in and they just have a good time together. And that's a big aspect for us is that family. And that's why we want that cohesion within the athletes. So Evo has been created on two format. Hey, how can we give out new training program, new protocols that never been applied to these kids around here. And second is um, no, an identity to those athletes. Hey, we want to come in, create ourselves our own team. So we have our team, we have an identity for the summer and we just love coming as a family. So that has been big. Um, now the next step for Evo is trying to get a platform to help other strength coaches and myself, younger strength coaches that are not as established, but are knowledgeable and smart to get a platform to like, you no, know, show what their, their worth is, how good they are and how much they can help and influence other athletes and their coaches out there. So, um, my buddy, <clears throat> buddy, Nolan Burner is in Victoria is like the first one that we added on to Evo. Um, and he has, he's been phenomenal. Like he's, he wants to get in, in the blogging and writing a lot of context like that. So that's this thing for us. Something I don't, I'm not passionate about for me. I'd like to outreach directly to the kids. So like doing talks like this and uh, YouTube content is what I'm more so looking into, but um, to having someone in and add more value to the, the, you know, the platform is great. Having guys uh, give him a chance to like let his voice be heard out there is awesome. So uh, that's kind of what Evo's at. It's been a bit of my, my journey so far. And then, yeah, just here to more time with Evo and all the athletes. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I think everyone will be able to hear the passion and excitement you have for performance in your background. And it's great to distinguish the fact that you're not just a coach or you're not just a theorist, but you are a practitioner. You were an athlete. You have been through the highs and lows. You have been through periods of realizing what proper strength and conditioning can do for your own performance. You've also seen what the absence of perhaps or earlier stages in your career, the absence of proper training, strength and conditioning, can how it can hinder you in your career which is super important. And so there's, there's so many things we want to unpack. And later on, we'll talk a little bit more about Evo. And we'll also get into a little bit more about injury prevention specifically. We can really start talking about the mechanics of how to truly optimize training. 
But first off, in general, I love to ask everyone, and you can choose to answer this however you want. I would love to know what your definition of high performance is. So if you want to take that in the context of an athlete or of sport training, you know, into your niche, or if you just want to, in general, what does it mean to optimize performance? Because you had talked about, there was one quote that you slipped in there and you said, you want to help your athletes unleash their potential. And to me, when I hear unleashing your potential, that kind of is the same thing as complete human optimization, ultimate human performance. And you, you uh, are a big fan of Dr. Bubs and he's big into peak performance. And, you know, it's, it's all kind of different ways of wording the same thing. So for you, how would you define ultimate human performance? Um, like I said, I, get, it, I like to unleash your potential because I, I've, I believe everybody has a, someone with a ceiling you can push through. Uh, most people don't get closer to ceiling. They're afraid of getting to that point. Uh, but getting to that full performance is all come down to uh, being consistent through your progress. And like being so doesn't mean that you're not going to have highs and lows, but it's keep on going through. So being so across all boards. So going back quick on athletics, I look at a holistic approach. It's not just your sports, your needs, and, and what you're in the gym, what's going on around that. So the holistic approach is everything. So for me, being from so you have to be you have to have a holistic approach, to everything as well. It's not just your sports, because you might be as prone as you can in your sports, but if your mental aspect is not strong enough, you're not going to be at your best. If your nutrition is not your, it's not the best thing at your best. It's a combination of everything. It's like a spider web. It's a cub that brings in everything under one, uh, one thing is your performance. So whether it's in life, it's in sports. So for me, it's an all aspect. And it's basically allowing for your full potential to be unleashed where you're able to get the best of you in every single aspect of your life. Right. And, and that's important aspect. because if you don't optimize each aspect, you're going to have these other obstacles that may may be out of sight, but they're still there. You know, it's, I think like the classic example is someone, if they're working really hard in the gym, they're eating right, but they, they don't sleep at all. You know, to them, it's like, well, I'm doing everything right. I'm doing all the exercises. I'm eating the diet. Why aren't I losing weight or why aren't I gaining muscle? Whatever it is. It's like, well, are you sleeping right? Are you under a lot of stress? Even if they're maybe not the first things you think of, you know, those are obstacles that will hinder and block your performance. So it's completely, let's remove every possible ob obstacle. Let's optimize every channel of our life and that will holistically flourish. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, and that's big a thing, especially with the younger athletes I'm seeing right now, like they're kids, I get that they're teenagers, but no, the priorities right now is like, Hey, how can I get this now? So they, they might post some, some will focus really well on their food, but a lot of them will post on, Hey, training, practice and that's the extent mm -hmm. of everything. They don't get the mental right. training aspect. They don't focus on the recovery. Like, you know, just like myself, we've all gone to those point or point, some point. Like you stay up late, you watch a movie. You no, know, you're on your phone late, chatting with friends and so on. Um, so for me, really, <laughs> for me, really, it's just trying to. When I mean performances and maximizing all that, it's you gotta have that same aspect and approach that you have in one thing into every aspect of your life. You can't ignore anything. Um, and no, performances is just the ability to unleash every. Um, no potential in every aspect of your life. That's my biggest thing for me. So it's a holistic approach. I don't think it's just one thing in one place. And yes, I'm getting wrong. You could be like a top performer in one thing. And I'd be great for some people to get successful with that. But I do believe, especially on my side, it, it's a holistic approach. It's, it's everything in your life that uh, will help. And if not, athletes won't get max. And you hear more and more now with pro athletes saying, hey, they diversify their approach to certain things. And, if you look at LeBron James spending a million a year on treatment, recovery, training, and so on, and I'm sure like he still has times for family and there are aspects of his life that is beyond basketball. And for me, that's what a true performer is, is people that spend time beyond just the sport need, the needs of the sport. It's everything uh, that branches out towards that. And you look at Conor McGregor, same thing. Like, And that's what, those are high performer and you see it because they do everything the right way. And it's not in one aspect, it's in everything. Yeah, it's consistent across the board. And to yeah. that point, I've read a lot about LeBron James and his effort and his commitment to recover, mo recovery modalities as, you know, as good as anyone else. I've also read that guys like Michael Phelps and Roger Federer, you know, they would sleep 11 hours a night. Like they're not skimping on sleep. They're not skimping on nutrition. You know, they're not no. skimping on anything. They are dialed in. Even I've, you know, I've listened to interviews of Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, and that guy is dialed in with every single aspect of it's if I want to be the ultimate performer, it's not just about what I do on the field. It's not just about my training. It's about everything. Yeah. And that's what it takes. And from my personal experience playing a few years of minor pro, and obviously I didn't advance nearly as far as a lot of people, but you're still around it enough. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to train with and play with a lot of guys at the collegiate level, at the pro level. And you start to see the difference. Like when you get to those levels of professional and you're trying to help your athletes now that are maybe five, 10 years away from that, but you're trying to instill these habits early. 
once you get to that level, everyone is very good. Everyone can play. Everyone has practiced lots. Everyone has trained lots. Everyone has been on the ice lots or on the court or in the pool, whatever your sport is. Everyone is very, very close. Like it's not that big of a difference. But the biggest thing that I noticed when I would see guys that would have careers that would last, let's say, more than two years as a threshold or guys that would buzz out after two years or fail, myself included, the biggest difference you see is it's it's the war of attrition. Like it is just an absolute grind. It just absolutely destroys you. So if you don't have your stress management in place, if you don't have sleep in place, if you don't have diet in place, if you don't have whatever your social factors are that keep you happy and keep you stable and keep you grounded, you will burn out. And it is so, so hard unless you are the absolute cream of the crop, which unfortunately most of us aren't. The difference between sustaining a career and building a career to the next level is those lifestyle habits that are built in. It's the holistic approach. So I'm so glad you brought that up because I've even just seen that with friends and teammates and guys that have gone on you have seen the guys that are 100 committed to everything and the guys that aren't and it's so important when you're 14 15 to have that instilled and i was lucky like you had said to have steve as a great mentor who really helped me build it up and i was able to train with guys four five six years older than me and kind of build up those habits but even then i definitely i think still lacked it i don't think i took it seriously enough in terms of injury prevention or physiotherapy side which is something that we're going to talk about in a little bit and being very very ultra specific in my training to how can i truly optimize everything so i'm glad you brought that up now the next thing i wanted to go into is you had mentioned a little bit this is this is kind of the same topic but you had mentioned about micro dosing for performance and i'd love for you to explain what you mean by that and what that looks like um okay first of all by the way i i, I don't deserve any credit for that it's all from uh course uh schlesinger he is currently with the Phoenix Suns in the NBA. Uh, he was with Stanford basketball prior to, uh, and that's where they came up with the ideas in Stanford. And um, while reading a bit on it, because it's tough to find anything really. Um, so the few things I found, I kind of did, did my own version as well, but I love the idea. And basically the idea is to how can we maximize, again, that holistic approach towards those athletes. So um the best to describe it for them was in the NCAA because the use of the Suns, it's all different, has to be adapted because the, N the, no, the NBA travels so much. You play so many games. Like an average week is what, three games a week. Um, right. So it comes in really handy on that. But the way it works, and my first exposure to it was with Andy O'Brien, uh, Sidney Crosby's trainer. When I played for Camrose uh, back in the days, it was in quite to the extent that Corey made it, but it was somewhat similar to it. So um, and this is one thing I'd love to down the road to implement with a, a WHL team. I, I would love to work with the junior team. It's, it's a passion of mine. I want to work with junior players. Um, so there's something I want to sell down the road, but basically what it is, is um, and how we generated when you get to the NCAA, I don't know if it was the same for you guys or not um, at your school, but I know for D1, you're, you're only allowed to be your strike coach for five hours a week. That's it. Mm -hmm. Athletes are allowed to go in the gym for more, but they have to be on right. their own. They're, they're not allowed to be supervised by a strength coach. And so it has a lot of rules like that in terms of coaching and so on. I'm sure you so know So many roles. There's so many oh, roles, yeah. Oh, so many <laughs> roles. So, and, and that's completely fine. I understand why. Um, so it's a kind of, it's a cool thing. So they have that. It's like the NHLPA. They have rules as well in the NHL for the players to know to go beyond a certain amount of time on the ice. Um, so of course, it's like, hey, how can I, we maximize um, training, efficiency, adaptation, and recovery? while still getting more of the guys. And the biggest thing is in season, you have so much stimulus as it is and stress with the school. So the more stress and the more stimulus, which is also a stress factor, um, your recovery decreases. So that's why most athletes, you see, they, if they're able to maintain great, but most of them, you'll see by the season, they started crashing. Uh, if you were to test them pre-season and post-season, their scores would be way worse than the end of the season. Their injury rates would be higher and the recovery would be down. Right. So it's like, how can we address this? And the idea is basically one is to improve uh, the amount of adaptation. So by that, what we mean is like, how can we have adaptation every day rather than just two to three, four times a week where you'll have adaptation, you'll see you'll adapt, go up, go up, go up, and then crash because you haven't done anything in a while. Or how can we make it so that it's every day, so every day we get a little better, just a little better. And we talked about that. I know you talk on your in your podcast the past the one percent better. Talk with Zach Fugelli, be one percent better every day. So that's kind of right. the idea. So how can we be a little bit better every single day? Now the other approach with that too is if we do something every day, we can hit every aspect of your training every day. So we can get hypertrophy, strength, power, max power, speed, strength, a conditioning. Those are things that could be implemented into your training. Whereas if you're training for a full hour every day for, for just four days or whatever then you can only, you're limited to so many things you can do within that session and within each session as well. 
So now you only right. have four days rather than six. So what he did is basically he broke down each session to a half hour session. So instead of having a four hour over the week, but in four days, he did six hour, or six or he did three hours over six days. Okay. So less training in total in terms of hours. So meaning better recovery for his athletes, um, more adaptation because there's more session. There's a session every day. So more there. So basically it's that they're recovering better and they're still on improving rather than mm. crashing and overdoing it. So that's the idea. So the other thing they're doing is that they match this. And we've tried at the University of, you know, of Library here with the men's basketball, and it worked out great. Basically, the way it works is you want to come down to one uh, bout of exercise a day. That's one thing. So, example, step right, say you're you're going on the ice. What time do you guys practice or practice that where you're in the, in the SP? Oh, and the SP is at standard 10 a.m., I think. Okay, 10 a.m. So what it, what it would look like then, you would show up probably at the rank – Oh, see, you most guys would show up somewhat early. I would say at least an hour at the latest. Um, but you'd show up with probably an hour and a half before. Get ready. From 9 to 9.30 would be your workout time. As a team, you guys will come in as a, time, as a team come in. Then the second part of that would be a half hour for you to get dressed and go on the ice. What this would do is it would actually prime your brain, number one, because now you'd be moving. You'd be getting ready. So you'd be primed and focused on practice. So no, like, We've all been at some point. No guys are just not into it at first practice. Warm up is right. awful. Coach loses his mind. So basically, <laughs> yeah, twi- twice this, a week. <laughs> yeah, no, there's been too much fun at times. But no, it's just the reality of sports. Um, but with this, is that you get your guys sharp because if they're not as focused in the gym, that yes, they lose a lot of their aspects and, and no, the intent of the training. But there's a ways you can line those guys up. Whereas if you're on the ice, you just lost an ice. And you know, everybody knows that going on the ice is hard sometimes to get the guys on board, but you need them more because you only have so much time you can spend on the ice every day. So you got to maximize your on ice time. Whereas in the gym, you kind of kind of get a bit away with it at time. So what they did, basically what they're doing, this is what I'm doing as well, is we get those guys in the gym right away. They get warmed up through the warm up, but they also get warmed up through going on the ice because now they're prime. Their body is primed to perform at their best during practice and their brain is wired and ready to go. That was one of the biggest thing with that it was on rail is that now instead of having two windows where you create a bit of adaptation in between your window, then you have another stimulus that make your adaptation drops and have to come back up because you only recover at night. You sleep. That's when you recover. You only adapt during the day. So if you're adapting during the day and you're recovering at night, but now your adaptation between doesn't get full 24 hours in between. So you're never fully fresh for each session if you separate the two. So if you were right. to maintain one block, then you have a full 24 or maybe like 23, 22 hours in between the next session. So you have a full adaptation, a full recovery or near two when you get back to the top. That was kind of the idea. And the other thing, and I, I love it too. And that's why I'm really close to my athletes. And I, I want to be for two reasons. One, they buy into me a bit more that way. But the second is the more I get to know them, I know how to push them. But I also know if they're off. And this is so crucial for us. Are they in it or not? No. If they're stressed because they have a midterm, they're stressed because they have a final, they have a quiz, that stress will impair their ability to play at their best. So if I see that, in a sense, I see them every day, I can tell if they're in or off. And if they're off, guess what? I might just tell them, like, get out of here. I don't want you in the gym. Because all you're going to do is you're going to impair your ability to actually get something out of it. If anything, you're just going to add more and more stress on your body, so your recovery will drop. And I know you're, you're a big group. Whoop fan, I have my whoop band as well. Yeah, um, and uh, no, it tracks. No, it's one question of how stressed were you and all that stuff. So, um, and it tracks. And stress is so crucial. People don't tend to realize how crucial it is. And I know for me, going back to my career, mental uh, strength and stress were my two biggest factors that uh, played against my career. I had I came to process. I was dialing nutrition, workout. Uh, I was as professional could you could ever, especially at my at a young age but I didn't have that stress control ability that I could manage my stress well. And I could not have that mental strength that needed to go through some certain highs and lows in my career. So, um, so it's such a crucial aspect, but it's even more crucial on the gym side, because now if you have an initial stress or your recovery goes down, your adaptation goes down, you see on your whoop, not everybody has whoop, but if you have your whoop, you'll see it on the whoop that actually, yeah, I was stressed. My recovery is crap today. So those are things when you try and that holistic approach goes on, but being doing a, doing a micro dosing allows me to survey the guys every single day. I see them all the time. So I get to know them really well to the point I know how to push them. I know if I can push them and I know if they're good to go in the gym or not. And that right. goes a long way. 
Uh, and with basketball, which was great, was we did the same thing. So we practiced at four, had our guys in the gym from three to three thirty, um, and then uh, basically the next half hour they would either get tape or they would go do some skill stuff, get some shots up right away. So the guys wanted to practice. They didn't even have to waste time on court warming up because the guys were warm. So we just had right to practice, and the guys were mentally prepared and physically prepared, and our uh, you no know, the risk injuries were low because they were like physically prep for whatever they were going to see that practice and their mind was into it right away so it worked out great coaches loved it um, we're hoping to do a lot more like I said I would love to bring this on to junior teams especially a WHL team with their travel their travel and everything It'd be so cool to work with that because microdosing is nice because it's easily uh, modifiable okay you can modify everything on the go it's easy to apply into any type of settings as long as your presence present with the team so when the team are practicing be within that window it could be after practice it's better before you get the more, more benefits before but if you do it after great and i think it'd be so cool to be able to jab with a, um, a you know, hawk team or pro team at any levels but really a junior team is what i like to work with um and then there's more aspect to it to go but without giving it away that's the gist of what uh micro is is basically how can can we manage wave your stress levels your fatigues um your recovery improve on that improving your adaptation and maintain a high level uh, training within a half hour window. And from my experience, when I played, or sorry, when I worked with, even played really, but when I worked with some some athletes, especially in season, athletes tend to not give it all, especially if they have a full hour session, they're going to coast for an hour session. So they're maybe going at 70, 70%. Right. So guess what? Now, 70%, that's what you're getting out of your workout, 70% of your workout. You're getting full intensity. And you know, the mentality, oh, if I do too much, I'm going to be sore. In reality, the more adaptation, the less sore you're going to be. So when people come come to us like, oh, I got to work out twice, I'm going to be sore for this weekend. No, no. The more you work out, the less sore you're going to be because the adaptation has been created. Soreness doesn't apply anymore. Unless you're doing hypertrophic training, soreness won't be applied anymore because you'll be adapted. So you'll be right. able to do lift heavy and, and squat <laughs> without having to worry about your legs being sore. So those are all things that need to be kept in consideration. And I hate when I hear that. Oh, I can't squat today because I'm going to be sore for the weekend. It's like, dude, it's, it's Tuesday. <laughs> or I'm work, we're, we're having a tough practice tonight. It's like, okay, if you were to do this more consistently, you would never be sore because you'd be right. adapted. You would be fine. Right. But now because of all that, um, no, it, it's just not as efficient. And, and that's kind of the problem. Uh, so that's why like, I think microdosing is such a, a cool aspect and it could like a good methodology of delivering a program while in season. And the other thing too is like, what I like is that you get to see your athletes a lot more. And then if you're not full-time your athletes, you don't know what they're going through. So having that constant um, no, feedback from them helps a lot because you get to know, okay, you know what, you're not feeling it. Let's pull you out a bit. Let's chat if you need to chat, whatever. Um, especially young, working with younger athletes, it's definitely needed. Yeah, no, I, I think that's 100% spot on with, with so many of those points. There's a lot that I want to unpack, but I like that you said, you know, the idea of this, it's all this stress or they think that they're going to be sore the next day. And for example, you know, a lot of that also is, is a whole nother um, rabbit hole that we could get into is how are you recovering? How are you taking care of your body with different yeah. recovery modalities? You know, if, if let's say you're staying up late every night on TikTok and you're eating bad food, then you know what, maybe you will be sore. Maybe you're not going to recover. But the first thing I want to dive a little bit further into is you talked a lot about adaptation. And this is something that I had to learn a lot more recently. And I've really become fascinated with the concept behind, uh, not just muscular adaptation, but adaptation in general as yeah. a human that can learn and apply. And I love if we just talked about this a little bit more. So I'm going to start off by giving you, I want to kind of summarize what my understanding of adaptation is. And then I want you to elaborate on that. And then we can maybe have a discussion. So at least for people that don't understand necessarily in the context of high performance training, what that adaptation basically is. So in a lot of the research that I have done, adaptation in many ways takes the form of neuromuscular adaptation or also endocrine responses to training. So when there is a new stimulus that is different for your body, something that is somewhat beyond your comfort zone, somewhat beyond what is standard. So whether that could be increasing weight, increasing volume, a new movement pattern, anything that is a little bit differently, your body is going to trigger that and respond. It's the same way that we learn through neuroplasticity where you rewire. Essentially, that's what you're doing, right? Is you're rewiring your synaptic yes. connections in your brain. So you're creating these adaptations and that allows you the opportunity to learn. Now, in the context of, let's say, training and strength and learning, I know this is something that is really prominent for power lifters. It is probably not as well acknowledged with, you know, specific sports or specific athletes that train for very functional purposes, like a hockey player, for example, has a very specific training. You train your hockey athletes different than your basketball athletes, different than your soccer athletes, different than whatever, for obvious reasons, right? And there's this, this curve. I, I don't know exactly what it's called, but essentially, if you don't meet a certain threshold of training, 
you're not really going to recover or benefit from it. If you hit a certain threshold, your recovery can actually exceed what they call super compensation, or it can exceed what your previous baseline was that you're making growth. That's how people get stronger because every time. However, if you also overtrain and you overstress your central nervous system or you create too much CNS fatigue, so central nervous system fatigue, yeah. it is really, really hard for your body to fully recover. So what happens is people that train frequently, if they overtrain too much, they don't fully recover and their baseline actually gets lower and lower and they get weaker and they just get completely worn out. And so when I start thinking about the importance of adaptation and microdosing, is you're finding that sweet spot every day where you're getting enough activation so that there can be gains, but it's not too much where you're creating excessive CNS fatigue that someone can't respond to. So you're not just saying, Hey, we're going to go in and do max squats four days a week. And then you're going to play three games on the weekend. Just like, you know, there, there has to be some balance. And I know I've been a part of different teams at different levels, whether that be junior or college, where sometimes you're thinking, like, I don't think my body can handle this. And probably you're right. And unfortunately, not everyone has access to uh, physiological data. So not everyone has a whoop to say, hey, wait a minute, like I'm way past, like my body is not recovering properly. And it's difficult to know for people, especially subjectively, if people are new to athletes or if they're younger athletes. Like when I was 17 years old, I wouldn't know if I was tired. If I'm sore, it's just like, well, I don't know. I guess I just got to work hard today because everyone else is like, you don't know if you're too hard or if you're not too hard. Because sometimes being sore, you can be primed and ready to go. Sometimes you might not be sore at all, but you are not ready to go. Like there's a lot more going on in the body. So when you're doing the microdosing, it gives you the in the moment feedback, it gives you the ability to tweak at a very finite level so that you can optimize instead of just blanket saying, we're going to do this boatload, which varies a lot for every athlete, every sport and week to week, even it's different. Cause if you have oh, a sure. week where you're, you're on the road for four games and you're traveling, you got late nights, you're on a bus versus you're home for two games in a week, you know, those are very different training weeks. And then obviously it's, you know, different at the NBA or NHL or NFL yeah. level, but especially when you're working with junior athletes or collegiate athletes or athletes even younger like it's super important to specialize that now the last thing that i just wanted to bring up before i let you just kind of go off on everything i've been spouting out is when i think of adaptation this is a another thing that i think not everyone may realize is well how do i create adaptation and so when i think about that i think of having different intensities of training you could have different volumes so that could be in terms of reps or sets you could have different weights so you could be looking from a strength perspective power perspective speed perspective different movements different tempos um what are some other ways as well that you can create adaptation, the ways that you, you know, create new stimuli that allows this adaptation to happen? Um, so within all that, you kind of mentioned, it's just the protocol that you're going to give out to the athletes. Um, so in, within each protocol, which is honestly too bad because we don't learn that in school. That's something you'll pick up as you go in your, within your career and then you'll learn more about uh, for our strength coaches and trainers. Um, so basically it, it's working with the protocol. And that's one way you can do. And also the prioritization of your week. So you have like your cycles and so on. But within the week, too, you get to change that. So for example, go with CNS overload. Anytime you're doing anything is heavy, what's heavy power, or your CNS is heavily recruited uh, strength, it takes about 48 hours for your CNS to recover. So those are things you got to keep in mind, too. So if you want a proper adaptation where you're going to keep moving up, not crash, you got to keep in mind, hey, if we did, uh, an example, we did. Uh, just a, a max power, uh, power squat. Okay. We're, we're going about 85%, 80%, and we're just going one rep, but we want to go like VBT. So, uh, velocity based training. So we're calculating how quickly you move the bar. Uh, if I were to make you do like heavy deadlift the next day, you would struggle with that because one, your CS hasn't recovered yet. You wouldn't have the ability to fully adapt because your body will still be trying to recover and adapt from the previous stimuli that you've created, which was the power squat. And now coming down to this, uh, so those are things that to keep in mind. So the, the proper recovery, the proper delivery of the program is crucial in terms of adaptation because if you overload, it's easy to overload. And long run, I made those mistakes as a young strength coach where I would like load up an entire week of training and the guys would do great, but it'd be depleted by them in the week. And then no, their active rest would be even more needed than ever. So those are things that need to be in mind. It's, but yes, the protocol that you'll never create more adaptations. And then you have like, no progressive overloading within the workout, within the, <clears throat> the protocol, you have the wave um, workouts. You have so many things like that that you can do. Uh, but what you said is exactly it. If you want to go a little deeper, it's like, it's just depends on the protocol. And then on the actual delivery of the workout within the week, the month, and the, basically the, the prioritization of the workout. Right. And then so also taking into account what that week schedule is and also being in conversation with the coaches and saying, Hey, are yes. you going to bag skate? These guys say like, is it going to be a hard practice today? What is the weekend look like? What is the last weekend look like? There's a lot of factors to take in, right? That's, that's the beauty of micro micro dosing is that micro dosing keeps all that in consideration. 
That's why. So when I was at the university, we used to work at YTP, so a yearly training plan. I've always hated that. It's kind of like just a guideline of what we do, but I always hate that because it doesn't matter. You could be at home. Yes, you don't have the travel to worry about, but those games could have been more demanding than if you played a weaker open it on the road. So those are factors you're going to keep in mind. So people, and that's why I say Galima, really, because you're really in, you know, ingrained within the team. You're part of the team, and it's good to be because that way you get to know, like, really the true feedbacks, and you get to be at games. You see certain things. Whereas if you have athletes or strength coaches that have so many teams that don't get to see folder teams that well, you don't truly know. So you don't maximize their full potential. Um, so that's why I got up for me, basketball was obviously my closest one to university. And I was really close to those guys. And that was one reason we wanted to maximize everything. And you got to show like our uh, rate of injuries has uh, decreased when I took over. Um, and then our performance has actually increased and we did really well and we made playoffs every year. So those are all things. And by the way, the, the old degree goes to the guys, the coaching staff. I just, you know, I helped them and I, I got the, the thanks from the players. And I know it was beneficial. So there's ways that we can always improve on all of that. And that's one, one thing with microdosing. It just allows for that because we watch game. How, how far removed are you from a game? How far removed are you from the next game? Uh, what type of travel have you had? How were the games and so on? Uh, no, ideally, it would be like what Penn State does in the NCAA, where they monitor their guys during practices and games with the heart rate. And according to the heart rate, you can tell, hey, you know what, this drills was way too high. Uh, they will go back to the coach and say, hey, maybe not put, the, not put these two drills back to back because it's too high in intensity. And then they max the recovery that way. Um, but being in Lethbridge, we don't have the, the funding to, to do it like that. And I have too many athletes just have everybody wear a heart rate monitor and uh, watch all their data. So, um, but you're right. Like you got to keep in consideration all that in the off season. It's easy because the guys have to skate, which we all know. We have an idea when their time is. Um, but the, the one of the main focus in the off season is training. Skating is an added aspect to that. Training is crucial one, because we're trying to rebuild your body and build it better for next year. And a lot of kids, and that's my biggest pet peeve for me that, uh, doing what I do is that I'll see a lot of athletes in off season put in the work. They're great. They're in good shape. And then they leave. And I don't send people a year. They come back. They're all sore, banged up, but they didn't do anything right. to see it. So yes, if you're an athlete, you're an athlete year round or the opposite. You'll see athletes they want or coaches and athletes do uh, or association. They only train their athletes in season. Often they don't do anything. It's like, because you're an off season, this means you're no longer an athlete. It's a 365 days a year. Oh, so yeah. you got to make sure it's year round. And that's a big pet peeve. But I understand like money is tough. Uh, it's expensive to do training, private training with someone like myself. And then if you're playing hockey and the fees in hockey are extremely high, um, it's not easy. And then you have other sports like basketball where working out is not part of the culture until they get to college oftentimes, especially in Canada. Like, But really every young athlete, especially in high school, should work out from the time they're introduced in grade 9, 10, and so on. Um, doesn't mean they have to lift heavy, but they need to learn how to move better. Uh, and because that's something that we don't do well, especially in Canada right now, we don't teach kids how to move well in phys ed classes. Like, Kids don't move well and they spend more time than ever, pardon me, indoor at the moment with COVID and more time playing video games and so on. So their ability to move has just decreased drastically, which leads to more injuries and a lot of kids earlier on specialize in their sports. So they only focus on one thing. And you and I both know that hockey players, we are really TFL dominant because we always skate the same thing. And if those issues aren't addressed earlier on and we've done those their entire lives, guess what? That's going to affect your ability to maximize true power efficiency through our glutes. And then our stride efficiency will demonize as well. And then, and if you look at um, other issues such as like the, the pronation of the foot due to skating, whereas the ankle comes inward, uh, that becomes an issue because our brain is wired to push through that, push through our quads. When we do squat, we don't squat necessarily well because we revert to a pattern that we've ingrained our body, which is the skater pattern. And then we no longer push with efficiency because when you're squatting though, you're a squatter, not a hockey player. So you should be right. in there and be a lifter but when you're doing certain things, either it's not going wrong. There are sports specific motion you're going to do off the ice to get better on your athleticism. But when you're squatting, you're a lifter first, but still hockey players revert a lot towards that hockey stance or that hockey mechanics, which affects their ability to one, build proper power and then minimize their efficiency and it can lead to chronic injuries on the road. So those are all the things that need to be addressed on. I'm using hockey right now, but this, I see a lot of that stuff, same thing with basketball players when they shoot, they tend to have a knee valgus and a, uh, also a foot pronation or leading foot. So those are all things that, you know, if we can't train that earlier on uh, in the gym, the chance of injuries will minimize as they age on. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to change. So, you no, know, 
uh, change the culture in certain sports around here or simply like educate kids that you know you have this is a year round thing and don't expect to leave here and come back in good shape despite what you think the more you skate the weaker you become so you need to maintain a off season or, or off ice training just as much as you do on the ice right no there's first of all i want to really get into injury recovery but there's one thing i just want to ask you really really quick and you talk about how you're employing velocity based training and so this is basically the idea that there's a certain velocity at which the bar moves when you are squatting or deadlifting or you name it and that can kind of indicate your power range and how much capacity the athlete has to perform and once they reach below a certain threshold where they slow down, that's an indication, okay, this is beyond where we want to train. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of great tools. And I was fortunate to be able to do that in college. We had velocity based training devices. And it was really fascinating because you can see the power, you can see your thresholds. But for most people, especially people that train by themselves, or like you said, it's an expensive sport, it's expensive to get training. A lot of people can't do that. So an alternative that I think could be a really good benefit. And I want to get your thoughts on so that people out there saying, Hey, I don't have these expensive velocity based training devices. What can I do instead? And one common thing that a lot of people do is rate of perceived exertion. So RPE auto regulation. And so this idea that you can subjectively, I mean, there are scales that you can use to say on a scale of one to 10, how intense was that exercise? And you can program your lifts to say, okay, today we're not going past an eight RPE, or we're not going past a seven or six. Do you think that is an appropriate method to help people for free manage their training load so that they aren't, you know, excessively inducing CNS fatigue? Absolutely. So for us, like right now uh, with COVID, a lot of guys are less of done remotely. Um, so all my application that I have for my workouts, we have a survey at the beginning and at the end of the workout to ask that question exactly. What was your uh, perceived rate of exhaustion? So RP uh, or no, re- no rate of uh, perceived exhaustion. Um, we have that it's same thing. So if, right now, if we do VBT, for example, training, so uh, velocity based training, if you don't have any technology, it's just fine. You don't need to. One of the best ways to do so magic numbers in terms of power, it can go up to six banks, how light your load is. Uh, so what I'll tell the kids right now, especially in bigger groups, go one to six, okay? but it's RP. So if you're not sure, have your partner there. If you have someone to watch you and it's we're doing jumps, it doesn't have to move the bar. It could be just the jump. You can right. do bar jumps and be VBT still. So uh, we'll tell, Hey, you have to do up to six vert vertical jump and have your partner see if he sees that your speed is diminishing or your height is not as high, then you're done. That's uh, how you so know you, you're both the threshold. Okay. So if you, you can't, can't complete yourself. six reps at this you don't have to. Yeah, performance it's, level. I'll say like one, two, six. And as soon as your velocity decreases, whether it's your power output or just your speed or your height of your jump, then you're done. So that we can, without really measuring everything, give us an idea of, Hey, this is what, uh, you maximize full efficiency because if you keep on going, then you're no longer really utilizing your CNS to maximize efficiency. It's just your body doing the motion, but that becomes more of a conditioning and you lose the intent of the workout, which is to build on power, speed, and so on. Depends if you're doing right. uh, speed, power, strength, speed, and so on. Um, so in this case, yeah, we'll say like have, we'll have the kids partner up and then internally as they age, they get to know, Hey, you know what? That was slow. I didn't feel that or I'm not feeling it. Uh, especially if they have like a, a short break in between with the resetting. It's like, you know what? I don't feel it. I told you guys, when in doubt, just pull out. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Because as soon as you do that extra rep, and yes, no, at times we want to push the reps. But in terms of VBT training, velocity base, uh, as speed, power, we need your intent to be at max um, capacity. So we want you to be super mindful of what you're doing. If you're not, and if you're disconnected what you're doing, you're not going to be good. You're not going to have a good training. Right. You're going to get something out of your training, obviously. But you're not right. gonna. It's not gonna be what you intend to do, and it's just improve on your speed and your power. You're right. just gonna. And it's not yourself. optimization. It's we're not talking peak performance anymore. You're no. talking. It's it's still better than nothing. But the whole idea is how can we unleash your full potential to make the best athletes, the best human beings yes. possible, and that is what this is all about. Take it to the next level. Yes. So and you, you know it's just like everybody else. Like you said, like everybody's so good once you get the pros, and it's a funnel, right? The higher you go, the harder it's going. Everybody's so good. So what's that one percent that'll make you better? Right. It's that little aspect in the gym that'll make the big difference, or in nutrition, your recovery, and so on. But it's that little thing that you'll do. So if you come to the gym and you're half fasting everything, it doesn't matter how good you are, you'll crash. But right. if you give that one little bit, you're mindful of what you're doing. Your workout is going to take you up, and then the rest of the game will improve as well with it. Right. Now, on that note, if we talk about performance and making it to the next level and getting through that funnel, one of the biggest things that I mentioned earlier is injury and attrition. And you were talking about athletes come back at the end of every season, just broken bodies. And I remember reading something about, I think it was Connor McDavid's trainer or, or someone like that. He's talking about how they have their 
hockey off season. And let's say it's, I don't know, four or five months. It depends on the league or, you know, it yeah. varies. And it would always be, you know, the first 50% of our off season is strictly on repairing the body. We repair mechanics. We go through an entire rehab based protocol, which is kind of what you were talking about earlier. It's not just strength training. We're talking about almost more of a physiotherapy approach to how does the body work and fixing the body mechanics and then tying this in. So this is part of your big vision is to make this, this holistic approach where we can optimize training, keep people happy or healthy, keep athletes healthy throughout the whole season. And a big part of that also then is when you were talking about microdosing, if you are working with athletes, like you said, there are so many little injuries and small nicks and bruises and things that happen throughout the year, like almost no athlete. It's crazy. I mean, the goal is to get through a whole season healthy, but even if you have the perfect routine, things happen in sports that are high contact and high speed. Like there are going to be injuries. There are going to be things that happen that you can't control. And if you don't have someone that's there, that's at every game observing the athlete and saying, okay, something's wrong with their stride or something's wrong with their wrist or their shoulder. Like something's not right. I can see it in their shot. I can see it in the way they're turning. Or you could say, I see this person every day in the gym instead of just once a week where it's like, no, no, no. I notice something is wrong. That allows you also on the microdosing scale to personalize your training because it's when you have a team that's 20 plus athletes, even as 10 plus athletes, it is not sufficient to have a one size fits all. There's no one size fits all training program because every athlete is so much different. So when we start getting into injury prevention, this has to be a highly personalized approach because you have to look at every single thing. And I think the most important thing, well, maybe I'm just saying that, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. You can refute it if you want. It really comes down to having proper mechanics because if you have improper mechanics, then there are different forces that are being applied to different parts of the body that maybe can't sustain it. Then you have stress, it accumulates, it causes problems. And a lot of times we just don't take it for granted or we don't realize what is actually causing the pain. Like, why do I have pain? Like a good example, which just shows the complexity of the body and why you need someone like you there the whole time to specifically create training programs and work with the athletes and understand them is for a long time, I always had a lot of knee pain, which is super common for a lot of hockey players, a lot of goalies. And I had, it was never severe, but I had constant knee pain. And it was two years ago. So it was during my first year of pro hockey two, uh, two or three years ago. Now, I guess the, the pandemic year throws off yeah, the timeline no, a little no. bit, but um, so I had some pain and it was in my left knee and it just, it wasn't uh, enough to keep me from playing. I was able to play through, but it was uncomfortable and it was slowly yeah. aggravating. It was getting worse. And I tried to figure it out. And so I knew I was super tight. I probably didn't do a good enough job of, you know, doing trigger point therapy or rolling out massaging and really, or stretching just everything in terms of proper body uh, maintenance and body mechanics. And then maybe my hips were out of alignment. So anyways, I had this problem. I kept trying to get it fixed with my trainers. We kept looking at, you know, okay, your left leg, or maybe it's your thighs, maybe it's your glutes. Let's try and figure out, work it out. So I ended up going to a chiropractor and we were really lucky that we had a great team chiropractor and was able to see him. And so he was like, he's like, okay, yeah, you know, your left leg is tight. And so keep in mind that my pain was all on my left knee. And then, you know, he went up to the hips and he would look at my hips and look at the way I stand. Okay. Your hips are out of alignment. So there's a little bit of a twist there. And then he traced it all the way back down. And finally he found in the quad in my right leg, just above my knee, he's like, there's, I think you got a really big knot here. He's like, I think this is the problem. And at first I was thinking this, what is this? Some voodoo magic? Like you're going to work on my right quad to fix my left knee. And so sure enough, he went in and he found a couple of spots and he brought out his tools and he was just digging into the point where I was in tears. Like I couldn't tolerate it. So I spent a week or two of just attacking, assaulting these knots I had in my quads and just working on rolling and massage therapy and doing everything I could. And sure enough, my left knee pain disappeared. And when I focused on keeping that, you know, all the way through, everything got better. And then as I got later in my career, and I wish I knew earlier, I started spending a lot more time focusing on functional training and stretching and mobility, mobility as like the foundation to everything, because there's this great quote. Uh, I don't even know if it's a, if it's a quote, but I'm sure someone has said it many times, but you know, an athlete that is hundred percent healthy, that's let's say a B level athlete is going to be more valuable to your team than an A level athlete. That's at 70% health. Yep. Right. So the, the best way to perform is to be healthy, like a healthy athlete, especially when you talk about long, long seasons, someone who can stay healthy the whole year. You, let's like take a look at Patrick Marlowe, who can play millions of games. It feels like that is high, high value. And so I would love for you to just go on a little bit further about the importance of mobility, of understanding body mechanics and how injury prevention as a whole, not only how it's so important, but how you go about it on an athlete to athlete basis. Uh, so first of all, quick last point you said, um, in 2018, I believe this one, the set was, uh, injuries in the MLB cost on average 63 million a team. Oof. Yeah. That's because you got to think one, first of all, when your player goes down due to injury, guess what? That player needs to be replaced. So now you bring another guy under salary, but that player still gets paid. So now you have yeah. two players on salary. 
Now you're going to pay for all the extra treatment that player might be needing and your team suffers because now you don't have an A player, you have a B player taking the spot. So right. injuries is so crucial to add to teams to prevent. And earlier in that statement, what you're saying is that you're right, sports cannot prevent. There's always going to be board me, acute injuries that all happens to the sports. But the goal as a strength coach and myself is to minimize the amount of chronic injuries and minimize the risk of some injuries happen. So example, right. hockey players, especially younger age, naturally due to posture, the way we sit and everything, we build a lot of tension to the chest. We also, we develop a lot quicker through the front than we do to the back. So it's easy for a hockey player, take a hit, be strong in here, rotate on, each, on itself because it'll take the absorption of the hit, pop a shoulder up because they're not strong enough in the back, not stable to the upper back. So those are things that need to be kept in mind. So not saying, no, doing all the proper workout will prevent that shoulder to come getting injured, but the risk of it will be minimized or the degree of the injury will be reduced as well. So those are things we're looking at. And then you're right. No, um, no adapt. I call it an anatomical adaptation, which is like the recovery part of the training uh, is done. Uh, is the same for everybody. It, it depends on every single one player, but in every sports, you have like a general line idea. So you're always going to build your workout around a certain amount of extra. Hey, this sports is these amount of uh, possibly, but you're right. Every athlete says something else. Um, you know, if you look at hips, there's so many algorithms you can look at and why that is in these as well. Um, and the biggest things people don't realize, and that's one thing that I pretty fortunate working with the bridge now, uh, here in lab bridge is that we have great physiotherapy and then, um, no, we have body assessment, FMS assessment, which I am an FMS certified, so I can do FMS assessment as well. It's just to see how well you move, um, how your body responds to everything. So, and for people that don't know what FMS or SMS, FMS is F F <laughs> F and that's so it's functional movement screening okay, so we're trying we to yeah. see like okay what are functional movements so like stepping uh squatting where you're at where your ankles and all those are all things that you know if you have poor mobility we'll see through those patterns and that's what we're looking at but um like i was saying in their podcast i would like i'll put my athletes through a dynamic line warm-up and i'll just watch them move and you can tell athletes especially hockey if you know your sports you can tell each athletes what are their needs uh, because they, they, they will feed into their, what they're accustomed to for sports and they'll struggle in their pattern. So you can expose them easily. Um, and that's the biggest problem when I was sports or uh, specification earlier on is that athletes build themselves one way and one way only. So if mm -hmm. we can edit that and help improve on that, great. So if you can do more sport, great. But if you can't, this is where I come in and that's what will help you out. But yes, every athlete is different. When I build a workout, I don't build a workout for each athlete. I don't have time, especially if I have like say 24 athletes in one group. But what I will do is as we go on, uh, we will correct them on site. So we'll modify. And that goes through the entire uh, season, off season. Now this so-and-so athlete comes in, he's banged up in the skate. Now he's hit line four, took a, took a bad hit behind the leg for some reason, block a shot, whatever. Or um, this athlete comes in and clearly needs some to address his ankles and that's something. So there's always things we can address and add more. Um, and within our workouts, we have uh, the guys come in, they have something to do and they all have something assigned to them um, where there's you no know, fixing their TFL, fixing their glutes, depending on what the day is. And then we'll go to a line warm up and we'll have an injury prevention at the beginning of every single workout. They'll also use as a preparation for the workout. Those are things I'll implement, but injury prevention is like, yes, depending on what you are. So I would also say, if you have a chance, you have someone like myself that can help you great. If your strength coaches may not know as much and seek the help of a physiotherapist or a professional that can assess you because from there, they will be able to help you out. And mobility is so crucial. There can be such thing as hypermobile, which for certain sport is not something that you want. You need a healthy balance of mobility, but you definitely need that mobility. Uh, there's a thing. And for people, mobility doesn't mean you're just stretching out for hours. Okay? Mobility can be achieved through a deep squat. You can just squat and improve mobility. And that's why in the hypertrophic phase of the training, it's so crucial to have full range of motion for two things. One, it improves mobility. Second, if you want full size and full gain in size, your muscles, the longer the, the extension on the muscle, the more, the, the greater the damage will be caused, the micro tears into the fiber, hence leading to more uh, size build up. That's what we want. So two things that's crucial. So each space is designed for that need. Same time, we can also say like, no, partial range of motion is also needed according to your sports because we know hockey players don't necessarily squat to a bottom position when we're in a skating stride. We're above that. So if we were to squat all the way down, 
and get at that sticky point, which is 90 degrees, just slightly above that, we would lose about 90, 85, 90% of our glute maximization. So once we get the end range, that triple extension, in this case, it's double because our ankles aren't fully extending. Uh, we would like only have maybe you know, 10 to 15% left uh, to really maximize efficiency. So those are things we need to address in the physiology and then the actual needs of the workouts of the athletes. Um, but in terms of injury prevention, it's like I said, it's knowing your sports, knowing your athletes, uh, watching them move. And again, I see a lot of good strength coaches are in, incredibly smart PhD and everything, but doesn't mean because you're that smart that you're still a good coach as well. So there's two aspects of strength coaching. There's the physiology understanding of that, the theory, and then there's the coaching side. And coaching means you might miss some cues, might not see some things. And I saw like guys, great programs, don't know how to coach and you see kids are affected. So uh, again, see the help of a pro to get assessed. If it's not a strength coach, then definitely go see a physiotherapist. Most of them, uh, and again, there's some bad as one. There's bad yeah, position in every jobs and everything you do. So right. check, do your background check, go see on a good physiotherapist and get a full body assessment. Um, and that will help you greatly because um, your needs will change through your off season, will change within your in season. If you look at uh, some, some, or symmetry in body position and body uh, size uh, or no limb size, you'll see that it changes drastically within a season to an off season because obviously we tend to bounce you a bit, a bit more than in season, you're obviously going to favor to one side over another. So those are all the things that will help reduce your risk of injuries. Um, and it goes on and on and on, like recovery is crucial, your uh, no, nutrition is crucial. There's so many things, but on my side for me, is like, how well can you move? The better you move, the less like you have injuries, first of all, because you'll be better at it. The second thing, you can still move well, but be bad in gauging the right muscle. So, so it's being mindful of what you do when you're in the gym. Um, so I, for every athlete, so I ask why, why are you doing this? Get to know, right. like, and I said, I, that's one thing I love with college athletes, no matter if they're in Kines or not, they always ask why, why am I doing this? And I love it because when they ask, I know now I'm going to be more mindful of what they're trying to achieve. And if I, if they don't ask, I'm always going to try to give a why behind it. So the athletes are aware that way you get that mindfulness behind the training and that applies to everything. Um, but those are ways that you know you can look at and then why would I be doing this? Well, it's this will prevent your injuries. And it's stuff sometimes like you don't feel like you're doing anything in the gym. It's just like almost like a waste of time, but it is so crucial and good for those athletes to work through this and, uh, and improve on their health or an overall health. Right. And so a huge theme that comes through all of this is training for a purpose. So like you said, mobility, it's about functional mobility. And this is specific yes. to every athlete in every sport, for example. It's not just enough to say, like you said, oh, I'm going to stretch three hours a day and I'm going to be able to do the splits or I'm going to be able to be flexible like a ballerina. You know, maybe that's great if you're a ballerina, but maybe that's not great if you're a different type of athlete. So the whole idea is having a deliberate goal of saying, how can I optimize this? How is this going to optimize the way I perform in my specific athlete or in my specific role? So Obviously, you've talked a lot about your process and how you go through that. And you are very, very well versed in what proper mechanics look like and how to optimize that. If you have someone who's just at home and they're training, maybe it's just because they want to be a better runner. Maybe it's just because they are a hockey player and they can't afford to have the resources or any other sport, basketball, soccer, and maybe they're just kind of on their own, which a lot of people are. Yeah. Um, if you were to describe kind of a, a layout or a framework in their head to say, okay, if I'm someone who can't seek professional advice, what do I need to think about and what do I need to try and reflect on in my own training to help me better optimize my training on my own? Say like, do I need to start off by assessing, okay, what are my goals? What are the primary movements? How do I look at this? What should I be considering in terms of what feels good? What doesn't feel good? How, how could you maybe give some advice to someone who doesn't have the luxury of having someone like you to work with them directly? So for, it all starts to your goal. So what, what's your goal? Like basically, are you, what are you training for? That's number one. Are you training for a sport? Are you training for like health? Those that's the right. separate. Now, if you're going to say, I'm going to go sport because that's what I usually do. Uh, but if you're going for training for um, sports, okay, what's your sport? That's the question. What's the goal of your sports? At most, most kids at some points, I've had some feedback from a coach or someone that told them, hey, you need to be better at this, this, and this. Okay, right. what are those things? Now let's make those a priority in your training. But we also go and look at the needs of your sports. What are the needs of the sports? Those are things we'll look at. Okay, now if let's say we'll pick basketball. Okay. Basketball, a lot of those athletes where um, ankle brace, they get taped on their ankles. So that will affect their ankle ability in terms of generating power through because they have weak ankles. So and that's why the, the rate of injuries is so high in that. So now, okay, check your ankles. Are your ankles weak? Are they strong? Those are the things you look at. So those are the things that you know. Uh, another good way is like, look at the uh, rate of injuries. What are they? What are the most common injuries in that sport as well? 
So right. for example, for hockey, a big one is the groin, but there's the, such thing as the hockey player syndrome, which is the correlation between the uh, adductor and the groin that can uh, affect you know, your strides, your shot, and then increase the amount of injuries and the load you, you put on your groin, which is heavy in hockey, is increased as well through the, the obliques. Those are things that are keeping track. Um, so, you no, know, and that's that's easy, that you can find online. So let's say, okay, first of all, what are you training for? Then mm -hmm. what are your weaknesses? And it's not always easy for someone to you know, assess themselves. If you have a mirror, great, look at yourself, move the mirror. But again, if you know what you're looking for, you'll just never know. And I see a lot of tons of influencers in, in on social media, like great influencers, but they're terrible movers, but they don't know there because they just never knew. So for me to say, yeah, what's your goal? Okay, what's your sport? Um, what are your weaknesses that you need to prove? You know, if you if you are um, a basketball player, you're in great candy, you're six six already. Most likely, you're not very strong or powerful at that point because you've grown so quickly. So for you, big I would be focused on power and strength. Um, size will right. come with that. No, especially at that age. Like, uh, if you don't measure the the velo or the high velocity peak, you'll never know really you know if they can gain on. Um, on size so it's stuff to you know, keep that and if they're that tall they need to eat so much calories it's stuff those kids so focus on other goals maybe than size because size is always the one that comes back to me all the time hey i need to get bigger i need to get bigger so dude you're 16 it will come relax right that's also the respect <laughs> of your game right now and there's such a thing as a correlative or um uh crap i'm forgetting the word right now um i'll go back to me basically what we're gonna get to like you have a strength ratio you have to your body and that's one thing if we can make that strength higher than your ratio the greater because you don't necessarily have to be big to be strong so if we can right. improve on that those are the things we should look at and then the stronger you with proper strength progression wants to improve on your tendon strength which will minimize you know, the chance of maybe knee injuries or just knee like chronic injuries that keep coming back from the jumpers knees that caught oftentimes seen in basketball players so those are the things that we looked at um, so if you're a runner okay well then what are the highest risk of running well shin splint is one uh, fascia or uh, plantar fasciitis is another one. So those are the things we want to look at. Uh, then you want to address those. And nowadays, like it's so easy to find injury prevention exercises online. Not saying all of them are good, but for the most part, you know, the guys that do tacos are professional, so they know what they're doing. I say guys, but I mean could be gals as well. Um, so there's so many that or stuff out there you can find. Like, even my stuff on my page or on my YouTube account, like there's tons of stuff that people can find on there for free. And, and that's the thing. And understand like it's not easy to do um, training on your own if you don't have the means to go with a pro. But if you have a chance to reach out those resources, go for it. And yeah, there's always people that are trying to make a name for themselves and are really good. So they might be willing to give you some stuff for free. So reach out, uh, get some help. And sometimes asking a question might not give you the best answer, but they might give you or send you in the right way or good way. Or right. they might give you some free content they've already created that might help you down the road. Um, if you can't have access to any professionals, so that's one way to do it. Uh, nice thing with physiotherapy is you can use your insurance to go see a physiotherapist that helps a lot of people. Uh, so that's also an alternative, at least get the assessment done and then you can kind of create your own program from there. Um, but like I said, there's always people like myself who are willing to go out of their way and, and help out others. So uh, by reaching out to us, it's always like a pleasure because at the end of the day, we want to see people like everyone succeed whatever the success is to you it might just be playing college might be playing pro might be just you no know, finish having a great high school career whatever that is we want to help you achieve that so uh feel free to reach but in terms of assessing yourself you just need to know okay what's your what is your goal what is the sport like the needs of the sports what are your needs within that sport and uh what are the common injuries in the sports that you can address and you know too and if you look at your background like hey i've had this amount of injuries so i'm mostly probably prone for this and then if i have a high ankle sprain before or just an ankle sprain what else could be triggered through that? Well, maybe, you know, my hips are out because I've had to live for so long. So I could address my hip now. Uh, maybe I'm not firing through a lot of the things. So honestly, it's easier if you have the knowledge that I have, but now you can read. There's a lot of free knowledge on YouTube as well. There's tons of good doctors out there sharing their knowledge. So um, resources are there for them. You just got to find out your goals and your why you need to do certain things. Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to transition into wrapping this up and I would love to bring you on again for another round two and we can build on this. I think there's so much great information that you have to share with people. And But before we get into my final question, we've talked a lot about Evo Athletics and your mission and you just did a great little bit there, how people can find you and get free information, which can help out as well as if people, especially if people that are in the Lethbridge area can seek you out for more advice. But I would love for you to just let people know 
uh, where they can find you, where they can get in touch with you, all of your social media channels, your website, everything that people need to know so they can say, I want to learn more about Alex. I want to learn more about nutrition. I want to learn more about training. I want to learn more about mobility. You know, you got a YouTube channel, you got an Instagram. I know you've got tons of great resources and tons and tons of videos out there and free information. So let people know where they can find all that. Uh, well, the best one would definitely be my Instagram account, uh, which is evoathletics.ltv. Um, it's where I get the most, I just post the most stuff on there. It's definitely the best one. Uh, I have TikTok, same thing, it, but TikTok is mostly just for, no, it's TikTok, sending the videos out and YouTube right. at Evo Athletics, uh, LTD, same thing. And, or my website, uh, evoathletics.ca. Um, those are good resources. Definitely, uh, Instagram is the best way to go, especially if you want to reach out to me. If it's not by email, go through Instagram, send me a direct message on Instagram. Um, really, really, uh, easy to reach out to. Uh, I am busy, so sometimes I don't respond right away, but I try to be really good for that. I try to be as quick as I can with responses. Um, and then there's always ways we can talk from that point on, but yeah, evoathletics.ltd on Instagram is the best way to reach out to me. All right, perfect. And I will make sure that I include those links and I'll tag you whenever, you know, I post up and whatnot to make it a little bit easier to help people. So finally, to close off this first round, because we'll definitely have a a follow up again in the future, I'm sure. And who knows, maybe three, four, five as we continue to grow and expand. But I always love every person I've asked so far on an interview is I ask for one piece of advice to optimize health, one piece of advice for happiness and one piece of advice for performance. Now, those can be interpreted however you want. I've got a lot of great different answers, but those are the three pillars of learn to perform. And I'd love to hear what Alex Serrard of Evo Athletics right now today in this moment would give advice for people to optimize health, happiness and performance. Uh, you and I touched base a bit about it earlier today. Uh, I, I had a similar answer on a different podcast and then the PhD, the doctor, uh, Dr. Lagrange was on there kind of gave the best answer and I've loved it. Consistency in all aspects of it. It's you got to be consistent. Consistency. So in health, if you can sit across everything, you're going to be healthy. Um, mm. That doesn't mean you have to be hundred percent right all the time. You're allowed right. to like, no, let yourself go a little bit, but um yeah, if you look at health, if you're consistent in your nutrition, in your stress management, if you're consistent in your sleep, you're going to be healthier. Um, if sorry, what was the other pillars? You have health, happiness, uh, and performance. Happiness. Same things. So uh, performance, I think, since the happiness, I would say like it's it's finding value in the little things. Uh, be grateful for a lot of things that you know. You and I were discussing this prior to this podcast about how like other countries sometimes like have so little but are so happy compared to us because right. we're always trying for more. We'd never take the time to just like sit back and say, I got all of this. Right. Like, why am I unhappy? I got so much to offer and so much to give. And um, so basically looking down to the small details and enjoying your moment uh, in terms of happiness, but in terms of performance and uh, health, it's just consistency. Be consistent through everything. Um, and like probably you will get it, but you got to be careful because you can go both ways. Because if you're consistent with bad habits, then you're going to be right. in a bad shape too. So those are things you need to kill. Be consistent, but do some a good habit. So no, get a good amount of sleep, manage your stress, um, be active, read, learn, do keep on for, and learn people don't realize, but learning is such a good um, mm. plasticity for the brain that improves on your brain health. But the same thing can be said for learning new things in the gym. So if you fail in the gym, that adaptation is also a plasticity creation in the brain that creates a healthier brain. So there's so many things like that that people don't realize. Like learning is just not, um, no, on the mental side, it's also on our no, uh, knowledge side. It's also on the right. physicality side of things. So you don't just want to be learning through reading books, which is great. You also want to be learning to power. So go outside, learn new moves, try move more, put yourself outside your comfort zone. Um, that will help your performances. But if you want to focus on the health side, you should add, just, no, take care of yourself. Be aware, be in tune your body. That's a big one. It's hard for a lot of people to be in tune your body. Your body is your best educator. It will tell you if it needs, if it needs a break, if it needs to eat, if it needs something. just stink to your body will help greatly. And then for right. happiness, yeah, uh, be grateful for what you have and enjoy those small moments, the small wins. And uh, like, there's no reason why nobody should be happy. No matter how hard things may seem, there's always something to be happy for. And Uh, be grateful for. Right. And it's amazing because you, you see people in some of the most extreme circumstances that still find a way to be happy. You look at uh, Victor Frankl, who was the Holocaust survival survivor in in his book. And he talks about that or James Stockdale, who was a Vietnam war prisoner for, I think nine years. And you know, who got through that. And there's, it's, it's pretty incredible hearing some of those people write about their experiences and you 
you put it into context, you think, wow, you know, my bad day was pretty awesome. I had a pretty awesome bad day, yeah. you know, when you really think about it. So I, yeah, well, yeah. Alex, I, I appreciate absolutely everything. This was a phenomenal conversation. You brought so much to the table. I'm going to have to listen to this a couple of times to slowly start to unpack it again. And then we're going to have some follow-up conversations very soon, but thank you so much for your time. I love what you're doing with Evo Athletics. I'm a big fan. I'm going to keep supporting it all the way through and, and everything you're doing. And, and let's just keep helping athletes unleash their potential. Let's do it. It's awesome. Thank you for having me. It was great. To discover more, this episode with all citations is available on the website, and you can also contact me on social media with any questions or comments. If you found this episode useful or think that it may help someone else, I encourage you to pass it along. Thank you all for joining me on this journey to lifelong health, happiness, and higher performance. And remember, always be grateful, love yourself, and serve others.